Well, welcome to today's webinar. This is Dr. Marty Peterson. I am the Outreach Coordinator for the Antimicrobial Stewardship Project, which was launched last year by the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar titled Global Antimicrobial Stewardship Barriers and Solutions with our three expert panelists, Dr. Deborah Goff, Professor Dilip Nakwani, and Professor Mark Mendelson. A little bit of background on each of our expert panelists. Dr. Deborah Goff is a clinical associate professor in the College of Pharmacy and Infectious Disease Specialist, and also the founding member of the Antimicrobial Stewardship Program at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center. She's well known internationally for her antimicrobial stewardship efforts and, and implementation. Professor Dilip Nathwani is Honorary Professor of Infection at the University of Dundee, and he has been awarded the Order of the British Empire for services related to the treatment of infectious diseases. He serves as Director of Medical Education Scotland, National Specialty Advisor for Infectious Diseases to the Scottish Government Health Department, and is President of the British Society for Antimicrobial Chemotherapy. Professor Mark Mendelssohn is a Professor of Infectious Diseases and head of the Division of Infectious Diseases and HIV Medicine at the University of Cape Town. He's also chair of the Ministerial Advisory Committee on Antimicrobial Resistance, the South African League for Antimicrobial Resistance on the Global Health Security Agenda, co-chair of the South African Antibiotic Stewardship Program, and co-author of the South African Antimicrobial Strategic Framework. He is the current president of the Federation of Infectious Diseases Societies of Southern Africa and president-elect of the International Society for Infectious Diseases. So as you can tell, our three panelists are internationally recognized experts in infectious diseases and antimicrobial stewardship. And they recently co-authored a manuscript in Lancet ID proposing a global collaboration in our antimicrobial stewardship efforts. I just like our participants to, uh, to encourage our participants at any time to submit questions or comments in writing to these three panelists via the WebEx chat box located at the bottom right corner of your screen. Make, please make sure to send them to all panelists. We will have time at the end of the webinar for any to answer these questions. And please be aware all lines will be muted during the webinar. So with that, I'd like to thank our three expert panelists, our international panelists, and participants for joining us today. Dr. Deborah Goff will be, will be beginning the webinar. Thank you, Marty. Well, it's a delight to have literally the world connected as one in this webinar. So let's get started. The world is one. As we know, antibiotic resistance knows no borders. Resistance anywhere means resistance everywhere. And the barriers to antibiotic resistance, it's more than just antibiotic use in hospitals. That's where most of us today who are on this webinar probably practice. But we know in the farming community, at least in the United States, 80% of antibiotics are actually given to animals to enhance their growth. We have consumers that pressure doctors for antibiotics and contribute to a lot of the unnecessary use of antibiotics. Our water supply can be contaminated with antibiotics from companies disposing them into the water system. And then, of course, the focus of today's webinar is the use of antibiotics in the healthcare setting, which is where we all practice. So let's just briefly touch upon what are some of the barriers. Well, all countries do not have the infrastructure to track antibiotic resistance. As this map shows us, you can see in yellow, there are some countries where there is no national data available to even identify how bad antibiotic resistance is. So it's no wonder it's hard to change prescribing habits when you're not even aware that there's a problem. And then you can see in gray, there's actually no information that's been obtained. So that's part of the challenge. When you don't know the problem exists, uh, it's hard to change it. So the global spread of resistance is real. This is a map that shows countries 
countries reporting the plasmid-mediated colistin resistance encoded by the m c r one gene so the first report came out of china and then as other countries began to look for it realized this thing was spreading like wildfire and you can see on this map where animal and human and environmental uh reporting of the m c r one gene has been identified so it is going around the world so what are some of the solutions that's really what we want to participate in focus on today cara the conscious of antimicrobial resistance accountability was the result of a group of coordinated experts after the united nations resolution on antimicrobial resistance that met so this alliance you can see all of the different um, organizations that are a part of it and they are focused on trying to coordinate the efforts around the world for global action so if antibiotic stewardship was as easy as following guidelines or reading papers on antibiotic stewardship that every hospital everywhere should have successful antimicrobial stewardship programs except they do not so i just did a pubmed search there's over 2300 citations using the term antimicrobial stewardship there are 481 nih grants in the united states for this and it's clearly more difficult than just reading papers so policies and publications are not enough because as i just showed you there's a plethora of them but we're still struggling getting programs up and running in all hospitals around the world and it is our opinion that you need individuals to have a global perspective and contribute to coordinating activities everywhere around the world and so we made an effort to try to share this process in a publication that all three of us and others from around the world contributed a global call from five countries the united states south africa the uk australia and colombia to collaborate in antibiotic stewardship and it is our belief united around the world we will succeed but divided we just might fail and so our goal is to have everybody collaborating and we provided solutions free educational tools for stewardship from five countries and you can read the journal article in lancet id to see this in more detail but we have links from all the wonderful resources we have collaborated on and shared so we learn from each other we learn failures and successes from each country and we look to learn from many others other solutions include global collaboration by collaborative research by mentoring programs online courses attending international meetings and the use of social media specifically twitter of which we're all actively involved on and i would encourage you to join in the conversation and join in with us on twitter so some other solutions that dilip will talk about as he's the coordinator of this is global research opportunities you might think well i don't have a lot of research experience is there any way to contribute and the answer is absolutely yes this is a point prevalence study from a global team and you can see dr nathwani is listed as one of them it's quite an amazing accomplishment and in as of 2015 over 53 countries represented here in these orange dots are contributing to this global antibiotic resistance coordinated efforts of hospitals around the world enrolling over a hundred thousand patients so this is an opportunity that is still available but we shall let him talk about in more detail so we all um, participate in the antimicrobial stewardship project that is coordinating this webinar today through the university of minnesota this was launched last year and this is one of the most useful websites what i call sort of one-stop shopping for all current 
data on antibiotic resistance around the world. So we do podcasts and webinars, policy analysis globally, extensive up-to-date bibliographies, news stories about resistance and stewardship, and a weekly newsletter, which you can sign up for free, and we encourage you to please do that. So the Stewardship Projects, our goal is to involve antimicrobial stewardship teams, including pharmacists, physicians, microbiologists, nurses, clinicians working in the healthcare setting, to coordinate efforts in optimizing prescribing and outreach with experts in the stewardship practice. The public health agencies with research on prescription and infection rates and analysis on regulations, the One Health professional approach, uh, coordinating efforts with our veterinarian colleagues, agriculture and environmental initiatives, and then talking about global policymaking partnerships. And that's what the three of us have done and work together um, on a routine basis, even though we are many miles apart from each other. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Dilip Nathwani, an expert in antimicrobial stewardship in the United Kingdom, to talk about global antimicrobial stewardship and implementation within his country. Dilip? Thank you so much, Debbie, for a fantastic um, introduction into global antimicrobial stewardship. Um, I think that sharing and learning from local, regional, and global experience is a key theme from Debbie's presentation that I would like to perhaps follow and expand a, a wee bit further. Learning from these successes and failures will be instrumental in how we effect proper implementation of stewardship, which is at the basis uh, of my presentation. I'm just trying to um, move the slides forward. Much of the evidence that we read around good practice is often technical and structural. And this is simply an example of a recent publication of good practice of how we achieve hospital stewardship. However, in my view and the recognized view that this is often not enough and how these processes are effectively implemented is at the heart of stewardship. And to me, interacting with the prescribing clinical teams and changing their behavior and practice is where the challenges around stewardship uh, are, are, are present. For example, if you look at successful global stewardship, and Debbie touched on these during her presentation, it is about learning from evidence and, and ensuring that that learning is not necessarily always randomized controlled trials, but it's experiential learning that increasingly people are being encouraged to publish. It's around processes and structures and ensuring that they are appropriate, adequate, and effectively implemented. It's around leadership. It's around human and technical support. And at the heart of all of this, is ensuring that whatever you do is effectively measured, uh, evaluated, and that information is fed back to the people who actually do the prescribing so they learn from the data with a view to bringing about further change. But if you look at what is missing from this, is, 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 is pretty important. And if you look at the evidence um, published in systematic reviews, the evidence clearly points that a range of stewardship interventions are effective in improving the quality of prescribing, reducing the amount of anti antibiotic prescribing. They will affect clinical outcomes, such as reduction in surgical site infections, reduction in CDI. They will stabilize and, in some cases, reduce resistance. But when you actually try to understand how these data actually were achieved, how these outcomes were achieved. One has to make a number of observations, that these data are primarily from well-developed healthcare systems, uh, often in the Northern Hemisphere. There isn't enough data uh, in terms of global data from lower or middle-income countries, and this is something that you will hear a lot more from, from Mark Anderson. And if we 
really are truly going to implement effective stewardship globally, we need to also learn about um, culture and, 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 and change. So one model for stewardship, which is outlined in this slide, is from the CDC. And as I said, it outlines many of the key parameters for antimicrobial stewardship. But what is missing, that if you take on board this model and the key generic components of this, and you want to apply them to a lower or middle income setting, what is the key thing that is missing? And to me, the key thing that is missing from that is the setting and the context. What we need to understand and what we perhaps do not get enough from the published literature is that if something was successful, we want to understand why was it successful? How was it successful? In which particular context was it successful? And as all of you in real day practice will understand that many things are successful, perhaps only for a short time. And when the champion or the enthusiast for that program or intervention leads, then the effectiveness of the intervention is also declining. So how do we also bring about sustainable change? And I think we need to challenge our colleagues across the world to publish not only their outcomes, but about understanding why they achieved success and how we can, as a global community, learn from these successes. And to me, I think there's a dearth of literature in stewardship, not as much perhaps in infection control about why a particular intervention or a range of interventions were successful or even failing in a particular context and in a particular culture. And if you look at this tantalizingly uh, eloquent data from the Health Foundation who are interested in a range of quality improvement, what they clearly say that if you do not understand and then try to change the cultural dimension of a particular stewardship intervention, what you will achieve is a relatively small change, and that's the second row. You, the change that we, you will achieve is often temporary and not sustainable. And I think the key secret to actually making sustainable change is to ensure that the strategic, technical, structural, as well as the cultural component of those interventions are aligned to bringing about that long-term change. And understanding the range of incomes in terms of healthcare expenditure and GDPs of different healthcare systems, and there are quite significant cultural differences from one part of Africa to another part of Africa, for example, are quite pertinent in ensuring what you do is effective. And I think that we need to, again, encourage learning and sharing of this information because by only by doing this will we bring about the change across the global communities that, that Debbie talked about that we all aspire to. And I think that if we're truly going to bring about change, we need to understand basic components of human behavior through implementation sciences. And I like this wheel, and the reason I share this wheel with you is that all of us, when we try to change a particular behavior, for example, in this case, is a change in antibiotic prescribing, we understand about legislation, guidelines, fiscal measures, regulations, and so on. And then we will try to um, bring about interventions that are educational related, that are restrictive related, that are persuasive related. But what we don't understand is the importance of how we can actually look at the sources of behavior. And to me, unless a particular opportunity exists for that behavior to change, and you have the right series of motivations by the team that you're trying to influence, and that team has capability to undertake change, you will not bring about the behavior. And very, very often when I talk around the world and I hear of people trying to bring about a change in behavior in prescribing, often one of those three things are not there to bring about the change that they aspire to. It appears very simple, but often not undertaken uh, very well. And the other point that I wish to make in terms of implementing change is that how often do you see 
uh, a particular model that is applied from one part of the world and that's trying to um, uh, try to be used in a healthcare system or in a in a in a structure that will not allow a particular model to be applied. So the one size does not fit all is a very important message. And if we're going to bring about that transformational change in prescribing and resistance that we all require, the process of adoption followed by adaption within a particular geography or a particular culture or a particular context is critical to bring about change. And it was wonderful that Charles Darwin said, and how often do we see that in our everyday lives, that it is not the most intelligent who actually survive, it's the ones who are adaptable to change. And that is something that we all need to try to aspire to when we think about solutions that are effective, effective change in stewardship. We read a lot from Northern Hemisphere countries about what work. And what is very clear is that many of the structures and the solutions across, for example, in this case, United States, France, and United Kingdom are very similar. But I think we need to be adaptable. We need to be flexible and recognize what we have in a particular geography. And I really bring to your attention this paper from Denmark, which I find one of the most fascinating insights into how a particular country with a very rural population who did not have infectious disease doctors by large numbers, who did not have a large number of pharmacists, who had only one microbiologist supplying a fairly large region. How did they particularly try to address a large outbreak of a multidrug resistant pathogen? And they used a range of professional, social, patient, and organizational interventions to actually bring about control of that particular intervention. And I think I would commend this paper to you because it really brings about the adoption, adaption, and then bringing about the transformational change uh, in this particular outbreak. We are beginning to see very early insights into the world sharing their successes and failures. What worked, why did it work, and for so how long? And particularly, this is a rather busy slide. It's not the intention to go through this slide, but I'll give you examples that you'll hear a touch about from South Africa, but there are examples from Taiwan, for example, from Chile, from China, and Vietnam about how they managed to achieve quite significant successes. And again, that is something that you can learn from and that would be adaptable and adoptable uh, for your part of the world. The study that Deborah referred to, again, is, is rich in its, in its uh, detail about how particular countries achieve success. And we actually get into the details of reading this paper. It gives you this message around sharing resources, mentoring about stewards being the advocates for change, but different programs can use different models to bring about successes in stewardship. And to me, as somebody who has now observed stewardship uh, across the globe, but certainly in my part of the world for nearly a quarter of a decade, I think the, the, the aspiration of all stewardship interventions and systems is to move from dependency to independence to interdependency. And I think one of the key messages that comes out from Debbie's talk, as well as my brief talk, and I suspect from what Mark will also talk about, is that I think these three stages are processes of maturity of any stewardship system, and you'll all come to the interdependency at some stage, but you need to go through these phases. Some do it quicker, some take a long time, Unfortunately, some never get there, but that is the way how you will bring about a change in the culture that will lead to the change that we aspire. So in summary, I think what I'm, the messages that I'm trying to um, advocate uh, today is that success for stewardship does rely on interdependency that is cross-geographical. It could be across healthcare systems. It requires leaders and stewards and I think there is a need for culture recognition and collaboration. We need to recognize that we are connected as a world. There is a high level of mutuality, but 
We need to celebrate, nurture, and learn from our diverse methods of successes and failures. I think as we've already heard that stewards in different regions are also global advocates. They need to reach out further to share experiences. We need to be um, having um, uh, educational resources uh, that are shared through publications and so on. I think mentorship locally across regions and globally is very important. I think we need to communicate not only with the traditional modes of communication, but online learning and social media and messaging are important. I think the formation of networks that support each other are critical to long-term uh, success of stewardship programs. And I think different models and adaptability, adaptability of models. And we need to include all the healthcare professionals. And Mark will talk, for example, around community workers are critical. But finally, we must not be embarrassed about failures because there's as much to be learned from failures as, the, as there is from successes. And many people are scared of taking risk. Medicine is about risk management as a stewardship, and we mustn't be scared of accepting some level of risk. And I think finally, I hope that all of you will also empower your government, your professional bodies to be advocates for a global stewardship program. So with that, I am absolutely delighted to hand over to my colleague, Mark Mendelson, who will give you a real world, true insight into how stewardship and the issues are undertaken in lower and middle income countries. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dilip. Um, and good afternoon, everybody from Cape Town, where the sun is shining. Um, I'd like to fully endorse uh, Dilip's comments and those of Debbie's. I think it is incredibly important to understand why interventions fail and succeed. And I totally agree that there is a, a real need for more research um, in low middle income countries to enable us to understand what works best. And what I really wanted to do was, was look at some of the challenges and barriers to antimicrobial, antibiotic really, we're talking about now, antibiotic stewardship in, in the low middle income country setting, which may be very different from, from those that um, are are in play in in higher income settings, but the truth is that the first barrier to to stewardship, I think, is in fact anywhere in the world, is understanding what your competing priorities are, and you know this is is very evident when you go to a number of countries. In my experience, in in Africa, but in in all areas of the world where uh, there are low middle income countries and you talk about antibiotic resistance to health officials in some countries they will just say this is not an issue this is for us this is not a priority not there's not an issue but it's not a priority and i can certainly say that in in south africa the priority in health uh, and really you know on a national on a national level over the last two decades or so has been hiv uh, and TB and and the entire health health structures were were really focused on the response to HIV and there there really was no very little space for looking at other um, concerning issues in health and uh, the antibiotic resistance the increase being one so I think it's very important when you're thinking about setting up stewardship programs nationally that one understands what the barriers are, are on a on a greater scale. Lack of political buy-in I, I, I just pointed to. We need to remember that there are still more children dying under the age of five from lack of access to antibiotics than from antibiotic-resistant bacterial infection. And the tipping point will probably come. But at the present time, access is still an issue. And it plays into stewardship because clearly if, you, if all you had was imipenem in a hospital, then that might be appropriate, but clearly it's not what we're trying to do and what we want. So access to antibiotics uh, is an important issue. Antibiotics here in South Africa are seen as 
um, an important part of going to see the doctor. If you haven't got an antibiotic when you come out of the doctor's surgery, um, it shows that uh, your, or some people feel that it, your, your um, illness is not being taken seriously. People will ask if you've got antibiotics at work. So there's a whole issue around social belief systems around antibiotics, in particularly in low middle income countries. And then there's an issue, a very real issue of education and professional development or lack of it uh, in many low middle income countries. Now, South Africa is a high middle income country. Um, there are 30 odd infectious diseases specialists in the entire country and many low middle income countries um, are, have far less. Um, this is also similar issues with other key role players in stewardship, um, including microbiologists and infection prevention um, practitioners, pharmacists, all key people, but the actual human resources in low middle income countries are often a major barrier. And these are things that we need to be taken into account. So what I wanted to do was now is just run through and, and identify the fact that there are different stewardship models, that the all singing, all dancing, antibiotic stewardship, multidisciplinary team that you might find in institutions in high income countries, and indeed in some low middle income countries like, uh, like South Africa, are, are unlikely to be reproducible in many low middle income countries. But we and others have shown um, that an antibiotic stewardship program in teaching in an academic center um, with the introduction of a, of a dedicated antibiotic prescribing chart which focused people's um, view or the, the prescriber's view uh, down to certain questions that by the time you then entered the antibiotic you wanted um, would have focused your, your attention on what, what you're actually treating. And then the antibiotic stewardship ward round where we went bed to bed looking at patients' prescriptions and really going through this and teaching uh, as we went and making changes. And like all other antibiotic stewardship, similar interventions, we showed a reduction in antibiotic prescribing of around 20%. And it's quite interesting if you look at many of the diff many from many different countries, the the impact of these antibiotic stewardship interventions, 18, 20%, 25%, these are the sort of levels you seem to be able to get to. But this is the problem we have in South Africa is that really there's only expertise in antibiotic stewardship uh, in a variety of different um, specialties that you would ex you would wish for in a multidisciplinary team in really two or three provinces of the nine provinces that there are. So we have uh, we have started a national training program in whereby each province will send teams of pharmacists, um, prescribers, be they physicians or pediatricians involved in infection and hospital managers to um, two centers, one in the Western Cape, one in Gauteng, um, for a five day residential course, which involves both taught elements, but much more importantly, taking the participants on antibiotic stewardship rounds in different settings, ICUs, wards, different levels of hospitals, and also giving them laboratory um, uh, so laboratory teaching so that they can then go back to their provinces, their hospitals, instigate antibiotic stewardship programs. And then, um, uh, and then there's a, an outreach and support mechanism to try and support. So by this, we are trying, as a number of other countries are, to rapidly upskill um, healthcare workers in uh, practitioners in antimicro antimicrobial stewardship. And this is the way that South Africa is, is tackling it. However, the, the need, Philip mentioned the need for tools, which is very real. And there are some wonderful tools, and Debbie did too. There are some amazing tools now freely available. Um, BSAC and, uh, and colleagues have a fantastic MOOC, which I would um, uh, uh, suggest that you, that you have, if you haven't already, uh, looked at to, to undertake. And we have, like many other countries, have tried to make uh, our learning facilities and learning um, tools particularly relevant to our own setting. So we too have, have produced um, web-based learning methods and short courses of, of webinars for um, 
for for our for our our setting. But what I've this this multidisciplinary team is again not something that is going to be easily um, replicated in most settings, even in South Africa and particularly in other low middle income countries. And therefore, we need different models. And this paper by Adrian Brink, Dina van den Berg and colleagues um, with, with uh, co-authorship and input from Dilip and, and Debbie really was uh, an amazing study which showed that non-specialist pharmacists, so non-ID specialist pharmacists, can have an amazing impact, a very real impact, 18% reduction, again, similar levels to a multidisciplinary team, by just attending to some very specific issues around stewardship uh, on a daily basis. And this was a sustained reduction. So pharmacists as champions and uh, important inter interveners in antimicrobial antibiotic stewardship uh, are a really important cadre, and we need to support and increase their um, their I I importance in this. The other cadre that is undervalued at the moment are the nursing are nurses. We have evidence from um, the antiretroviral program in South Africa that task shifting from physicians to nurses in the rollout of antiretroviral therapy showed no detriment in um, virological control uh, uh, and patient well-being. And this was a really, land, again, a landmark study which showed the importance of nurses in antimicrobial stewardship. And this is one cadre of worker that uh, we and many other countries are looking to now to see how they can play a much greater role. Our, nursing, our nurses also in the country um, are involved in a um, algorithmic guideline, new algorithmic guideline um, package called PAC, um, which really looks at presentations. So patients coming into the clinics with headache, for example, in this respect. And there's a whole algorithm which isn't shown here, but right up front, um, the most dangerous issues in here, uh, meningitis, is dealt with. And so nurses who do so much of the prescribing of antibiotics in South Africa and low middle income countries are being given the tools to be able to, uh, in, to, to, to act in this way. Now, Dilip mentioned community healthcare workers because we need to really look outside the box far in a far greater way. And a number of tools, um, the integrated community case management and the integrated management of childhood illness have been uh, in play for many years in, in low middle income countries and are important again, um, ways, tools for uh, nurses and community healthcare workers to provide um, clinical care. And there's been a number of studies which have shown that, that healthcare workers that are trained in, in these um, programs are more likely, the, the children in this study, children that were cared for by IMCI trained healthcare workers are more likely to receive the correct prescriptions for the antimicrobials, be them antibiotics or antimalarials. They were more likely to have that important first dose. And importantly, they were also more likely to be given advice by the caregiver on how to give um, antibiotics at home. So training is important. Add on to that rapid uh, diagnostic, po point of care diagnostics, and you have very powerful tools to perform stewardship. So this study from David Hamer and colleagues in Zambia showed that if you had the um, community case management algorithms and you added in the malaria rapid diagnostic test, not only did you reduce inappropriate antimalarial therapy, but you increased by fivefold appropriate and timely delivery of antibiotics for pneumonia. So the rapid diagnostic test introduction, the key in low middle income countries. And then, you know, community health work workers take many forms. These are, this is a study in traditional birth attendants um, in reducing neonatal mortality, just by not only by antibiotic stewardship, this is also involved um, training on neonatal resuscitation, but stewardship was involved in this with an impressive reduction in death. Village, well, village women trained in neonatal care and sepsis as well, um, the, in this study, a reduction in case fatality 
when village women were trained and were able to give antibiotics um, for those who were refusing referral. And this is a, a really important intervention and a cheap intervention in terms of obviously averting deaths. So this again shows you know, that we need to think outside the box and add uh, different groups to our uh, cadres workers to our stewardship uh, interventions. But how are we going to finance this in low middle income countries? And that's a huge, on a global scale, that's a really important question we feel. There's a lot of money currently going into uh, the research and development of new antibiotics. There's a, a lot of money going into new diagnostic tests. But there's an awful lot, including stewardship, um, including improving um, basic water and sanitation, improving public awareness, and of course, the whole issue around how we're going to pay for the stewardship of antibiotics uh, in the animal sectors. So we need funding for this. Uh, and that's one of the challenges and barriers that we're going to find in rolling out antibiotic and antimicrobial stewardship in low middle income countries. So what I've tried to do here is, is show you that there are different models of antibiotic stewardship for low middle income countries key role players, key people we need to um, support and increase their role, pharmacists, nurses, community health workers, in addition to doctors. This is a global issue and we all need to play a part. And there I'm going to leave it and turn it back over to uh, the hosts. Thank you. Thank you, experts. This is Marnie Peterson coming back online here. Um, and so uh, this is a, a point at which we'd like to have some conversation. And I'd like um, our participants, if you have any questions or comments for experts, please submit those via the chat box. But we've um, also prepared some questions that we are going to have a discussion with our, our panelists. And I believe Debbie Goff is going to, to lead this discussion. The, the first question being global perspective. And we thought perhaps, Philip, that you would like to um, perhaps take the lead on this um, to try to explain how someone can connect to the global tools, understand the perspectives, and adapt their resources to meet their own cultural context. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think. Um, the premise of my presentation of was very much along the lines of this question, and and it's one of the most uh, common questions that we tend to get asked is, how do I do this uh, in my part of the world? And I think that what would be helpful uh, for a person asking that question is perhaps in the first instance is to have an understanding of what the problem is uh, in their particular um, part of the world and try to clarify that problem and make that problem as simplistic as possible. Because what tends to happen is they try to do too much and try to solve too many problems. And perhaps prioritize what the problem is and understanding that problem based on some local data and encouraging the local team to collect some data to identify the problem. And Debbie, you in the past have written quite extensively, for example, about the low hanging fruit and it's trying to understand what is the lowest hanging fruit that matters to the community whose behavior you're trying to change. Once you've done that, it's perhaps then try to um, have a conversation with people within your culture, within your country, within your region, who may be able to share similar experiences for you. And I think the, the, the thing we learned when we presented those five successes and failures across the world is that I think increasingly a true connectivity, uh, be it through the internet, be it through cultural leaders or, or stewardship leaders, we need an ability for somebody from a particular community to seek help uh, to a particular question that may be offered, that they may have, somebody may have a solution that is culturally specific that they could adapt. So to me, uh, in, in, in summary, is to identify the problem, ensure that problem matters to the people uh, that use behavior you're trying to change, get some buy-in, share that problem 
uh, across your own region, your own country. I'm sure people will have experience of that and then spread uh, that, that conversation uh, more globally. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, this is Debbie. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good. I sound like that television commercial. Not sure what happened with the sound. But I think um, just to add on to Dilip's uh, wise comment, I think this webinar today just demonstrates the global willingness to collaborate. As we have colleagues from the UK, Iran, South Africa, Egypt, South America, and Nigeria, and Canada, and then of course people from the US, the CDC who helps develop our national policies, the stewards who really do the boots on the ground work, and our colleagues in industry who help discover the antibiotics. So I think it's just a, a beautiful story of how people do want to reach out and help each other, and this is the first step. And so demonstrating how to work locally, um, but also globally, connecting with each other through the webinar, through social media, all of us are on Twitter, and it really is an amazing way to connect and help each other. I would continue to encourage that. And I think Mark and Dillup just so wisely um, pointed out some things, specifically Mark in your um, study of how you did war grounds and the specific antibiotic chart review. You know, people must know and trust their antibiotic steward. In the United States, we have electronic health care records, and one of the fatal flaws of stewardship is if you try to do it from a computer. So never a good approach, and I really appreciated Mark's insight into that. And, and Dillip, your slide of understanding behavior on the implementation science, you know, I think the key, which leads to this um, uh, second question that we're going to go to now, um, your key on uh, capability, motivation, and opportunity. I think we have colleagues around the world, no matter if you're in Vietnam with no infectious disease trained physician or pharmacist, um, how do you incorporate non-infectious disease specialists yeah. to get engaged in stewardship and engage everybody, meaning our colleagues in surgery and that. If you are motivated to make a difference and are capable of making a difference, the opportunity is sitting right there in Dilip, your slide so beautifully demonstrated that. And I think we have all found in our professional experience, we work with many pharmacists, physicians, nurses that are not trained in ID, but they are motivated and capable and have that desire to make a difference in patient care. And if you make that first step to reach out to our colleagues that are not ID trained, um, you know, Dillip's MOOC program, which is the massive online open um, course to teach antibiotic stewardship, as we demonstrated, the tools are all out there. You, you can teach people some of the basics but then you can connect to global experts. And I think um, that's our goal of today is really trying to connect the world with experts and, and realize every single individual is what will make stewardship work. It's not just national experts. We might kind of guide the ship, but every person on that ship needs to be involved. And that's every person listening to the webinar today. It won't, a policy won't make the difference. It's the people that will make the difference and uh, we just help guide and provide some insight. Uh, Mark or Dill, if you want to comment on engaging uh, others in your stewardship yeah. models in your country? Off you go, Mark. Yes, I think so. I, I think, the, you know, the, the first and probably the most important thing to say is that, you know, and, and, and a question has come in about how important are ID physicians in middle-income countries. Actually, I think globally, it would be wrong to suggest that infection specialists are the most important people in stewardship. I don't think that's the case at all. And I think it talks to what Dilip and, and Debbie have both said that, you know, motivation, drive and education and understanding of the problems is, is the key issue. There is no reason why this needs to be led by infectious diseases specialists. I, I differ from the, the I think the, the US based view, IDSA based view on that. I, we, we are training in our, in our training programs, we are training physicians and pediatricians who are not ID infectious disease specialists. And although infectious disease specialists may have some greater insight 
training can be given and transfer of skills, particularly on these stewardship rounds. We are teaching every day our registrars and our junior our interns and students, and they are becoming advocates. So in terms in the doctor, sort of, sort of the medical physician, pediatrician side of things, you do not need to be an infectious disease specialist to be a good steward. In fact, some of the best stewards I know actually have on infectious diseases trained. And, you know, the, the explanation, I think I've tried in my talk, I've tried to explain why it's important to shift stewardship models, um, particularly in low, low middle income countries, because the human resources just aren't there. So we need dedicated, passionate people um, who care about this and understand the problem to take this forward. Um, and, and I have to say, I, I entirely agree with what, what's been said, particularly by Mark. In the Danish study that I pointed out, it was gastroenterologists, pulmonologists, and intensivists who saw the problems with bad prescribing led the teams to actually bring about the change. So I, I very much agree with what has just been said. Thank you. Um, let's just go to this last question that we prepared, is the global research opportunity. And Dilip, I'll direct this to you, the point prevalence study. How can people become involved in that? And do you envision this data? How is it going to be utilized? So how about if you tell people how they can become involved? Okay, so I, I think that's a, that's a fantastic uh, plug for the uh, global PPS. Thank you, Debbie. Um, we, we, we've completed the 2015 study, and I think uh, now you'd go on the global PPS website and you mm -hmm. register your interest, and there is a a plethora of material to support you as well as a, 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 a help desk that will help you through the kind of trials and tribulations of undertaking such. And the languages that the material will be available for at least 18 key languages across the globe. It's free of charge, you're supported, and the data is yours uh, to use and do as you please. And I would encourage you to use that data to actually feed it back to the prescribers to bring about change. And, and I think it's a very powerful tool. Uh, it allows you a near four month flexibility to do the study. And the only thing the global PPS people ask is for them to be able to collate on a central database your data. And I think that, you know, unless you know the barometer of where you are with a particular problem, really you will not be able to address the problem and then measure any success. So to me, a global point prevalence survey or a local point prevalence survey is fundamental to stewardship. And in my part of the world, we don't do them infrequently. We target particular areas. We had a bunch of badly behaved surgical people for some time, and we undertook uh, PPS uh, on their wards every month for six months till we brought about the desired change. So it does not need to be hospital-wide, which is the impression given by the global PPS, you can actually use it for targeted prevalence studies to bring about the change that you require. So I think it's a wonderful and a basic stewardship tool. Thank you, Jill Up, and what a great opportunity for any steward around the world to participate and contribute to a stewardship study. We have a question from a specialist, an infectious disease specialist in Ecuador, asking how to get stewardship up and going in a private hospital setting where they are private practice physicians and there's no guidelines, um, so each one does something different. Uh, I would encourage you to look at the paper that Mark uh, discussed in Lancet ID, which was by the NetCare pharmacist in South Africa, who I work with, and that is a private hospital system in South Africa, where the pharmacist there faced the exact same challenge. Because the physicians are private practice, they tend to each do what they feel is best. And how did we get stewardship up and going, and not just get it up and going, but succeed beyond my wildest dreams, as that study showed, the success in the 47 net care hospitals, which was really led by the pharmacist in those hospitals. We started with a project called Hang Time um, to engage physicians that are all doing their own individual uh, practice is sort of hard until they see value in what the pharmacist or who's ever leading the stewardship initiatives might provide. Hang time was defined
happened is the time from when the doctor wrote the prescription order for an antibiotic to when the drug was actually infused into the patient. And in a paper-based hospital, that time frame, I will anticipate, as they showed in South Africa, and we did in the U.S. many years ago when we were paper-based, can be upwards of six to nine hours. Obviously, in the manage of, management of a patient with sepsis, that's unacceptable. So that's where we started in the private hospital settings of NetCare. And as the slide showed, those pharmacists made a phenomenal impact. And that was the first stewardship project, and they have continued to succeed every year from that point on. So I would recommend selecting something as simple as that. They did not receive additional FTEs. They incorporated this into their daily workflow and made a difference in the care of patients. And every physician will become engaged when they realize the motive of stewardship is to improve patient care and outcomes. So the Hang Time Project is called a Low Hanging Fruit Stewardship Initiative. There's other ideas I have that I'd be happy to share offline, but that is um, my recommendation in the private sector hospitals in getting the stewardship initiative off the ground. And, and th that's well said. Um, if I may just add to that, the only thing I would add to that particular question is that um, no private clinician or any other clinician wants to be seen as somebody whose care is associated with bad outcomes. And certainly one of the drivers for some of our private clinicians to engage in stewardship, it's only 5 to 10% in the United Kingdom, but they've kind of got involved because they began to see high rates of surgical site infections, for example, outbreaks of Clostridium difficile, uh, small outbreaks of, of multidrug resistant pathogens that were associated with their hospital. And once they began to understand that, that it reflected on their care, their kind of um, uh, participation and engagement with stewardship became much, much better. I, can I just add, I, I mean, I think Debbie's approach is, is, is right. You know, if you can show that a, a simple intervention works and improves outcome, um, that's fantastic. You know, the data is key here. So if you, if you do have resistance data for the hospital, um, if you have consumption data, and if you have data on uh, the incidence of hospital-acquired infections, whether you look at all of them or you concentrate on one, you know, it's very important to present this also to hospital managers, to, uh, you know, your colleagues. So I, I would also look at the data that you have available um, as you plan your interventions uh, so that you can actually show, also have a, 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 a trend uh, and see uh, over time whether your interventions actually into, a, into the hospital actually work. question there about giving an example or describing if you're talking about the culture of the society or culture of the healthcare system. Sorry, I, I, I didn't see that question. But that question... It's not, let me uh, repeat it. it. It's talking, you talked about the importance of, uh, just a second, the culture in stewardship. Are you referring to the culture of the society? of the country or culture within the healthcare system? And could you just give them an example of a cultural practice that improved stewardship? Yeah, yeah, okay. So I, 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 no, it's both. It, it's um, culture of a particular country will permeate into the culture of, of a healthcare system. I think the two are, are very directly related. I can give you an example in which um, in, in India, for example, there was a cardio thoracic unit that was regarded as the premier cardiothoracic unit in that part of the world. And the practice remained of four days of antibiotic prophylaxis, regardless of, of, of patient risk factors and so on. And you could not influence because they, they felt that a broad spectrum antibiotic for a protracted period would cover for infection in this very complex group of patients. And the, the culture was not only that uh, a longer period of antibiotics is better, 
but the culture was also that if you're a premier unit, you need to be seen to be giving antibiotics for longer because that's what premier units do because they look after sicker group of patients. And also that the clinicians who are prescribing antibiotics for longer were doing it because they valued safety more. And, 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 and doing more was also directly correlated in that culture with being more uh, efficient and safer in, in practice. So how do you actually get around some of the clear uh, deficits in thinking in that particular practice proved to be a significant challenge. And when you're a high performing cardiac surgeon in that culture, they are regarded as the kind of top of the tree in terms of clinicians. It's very difficult for antimicrobial management teams or stewardship teams to actually question the practice uh, of, of, of those practitioners. So there are some real challenging cultural issues uh, based on uh, thinking that was uh, quite established in that particular culture. And it's an example of how the challenges that you'd have to try to manage that. Thank you so much, Dilla. Well, we are at the top of the hour, which will conclude our webinar. I want to thank my colleagues, both Mark and Dilla, for outstanding contribution to this global webinar on antimicrobial stewardship. We hope to really unite stewards around the world and engage them. All three of us are on Twitter. You can just type in our name and find our Twitter feed as one source. The SIDRAP ASP website is an outstanding opportunity to uh, follow breaking news and infectious diseases. Uh, Dr. Nathwani and BSEC's uh, online MOOC program is a great global tool to educate others around the world. So all of us have, uh, and again, our article in Lancet ID gives you many resources from all five countries, and it's really just the start of the global collaboration. We hope you enjoyed today's webinar. Thank you for attending. Thank you. And I'll just remind all of our participants, the webinar uh, will be posted on our YouTube channel. Uh, um, youtube.com forward slash user forward slash SIDRAP ASP. Thank you so much.